I don't know if I should admit uh, in, in this company that my degree is actually a degree in computer science. I worked for IBM for uh, eight years in the 1980s and I did spend two years of that writing code. I did uh, go on to work uh, at BT for 10 years, but we're all allowed to make one mistake, aren't we? <laughs> so I'm going to talk um, for 10 minutes on uh, the White Fibre Gigabit Island project, uh, which we announced this time last year at the um, uh, Gigabit, uh, at the digital conference. Actually, the cable had gone slightly undone there. There we go. Technology. So the Gigabit Island project, we announced it a year ago. First few slides, I apologize if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but worth reinforcing uh, some of these points. Um, the Gigabit Island project so is a 35 million pound investment from InfraCapital partners who are part of Energy Investments, part of their credentials. So, institutional investors who invest in capital infrastructure projects, and that's what this is. Um, match funded by um, money from the government's Digital Infrastructure Investment Fund. It's a full fibre deployment. We think we're going to get to around 65,000 of the 74,000 premises on the island. So, that's businesses and uh, homes. The final number we need to get further into our detailed planning before we can uh, um, be certain. Um, so that's a very high percentage penetration by any standards anywhere. It's going to give the island some of the fastest broadband speeds in the world, not just in the UK, in the world, and, and I'll come to why in, in a little bit. The key word that I'm using about the White Fibre Gibbet Island is future-proof. So what we're deploying here is going to be good for decades to come, if not 50 years, uh, 100 years. And the reason for that is, is this. Uh, we all talk about fibre broadband in the UK. We've talked about it for about the last seven years. Today's fibre broadband um, is actually fibre to the cabinet and then from the home, uh, from the cabinet into the home is still this 120-year-old twisted pair technology, which just, um, it, it's, it's good enough for today, but it's not going to be good enough for five or 10 years' time. So there, there you have it in a picture, um, telephone exchange to the cabinet, and then from the cabinet into the home, uh, still twisted pair. In the new uh, full fiber world, you take, um, the twisted pair out and you put um, more fibre all the way into the home. And a white fibre, we're taking it uh, one stage further uh, because we're deploying what's called a point-to-point a, a -point, uh, fibre network. Uh, and the difference is, so uh, a point-to-multipoint, -point, which is a more typical type of fibre deployment being deployed by other providers in the UK, such as BT, you get one fibre running down a street and that one fibre is shared by all the homes in that street. Good enough for the next five or ten years, I'd argue uh, it's a brave person that says beyond ten years that that one fibre for one whole street is going to be enough. In the white fibre world we're deploying what's called a point-to-point -point network which means every home gets its own dedicated fibre. In fact it's getting uh, a cable containing four fibres. I have no idea what the extra fibres are going to be used for, but that's part of um, the future proof. Uh, who, it's a brave person that predicts out more than five to ten years in this industry. Even five years ago, who here would have thought they'd have stopped watching broadcast TV and watched all of their TV bar live sports events uh, on demand or at the time of their choosing, not of the network's choosing. So. Um, where are we with our project? It's a big project. Um, in, we started already. Um, the project will see us digging half, uh, 500 kilometres of trench uh, on footpaths here in the island. Into that trench, those trenches, 5 million metres of duct, and into that duct, uh, about 750 million metres of fibre. That's because we're putting multiple fibres uh, into each duct. 
a lot of work goes in to doing this. So we announced this a year ago, and we've just been through a massive planning phase. We've had to for every single street on the island um, plan down to uh, the most immense detail exactly where uh, the cable is going, avoiding water pipes, electricity pipes, other street uh, infrastructure. We've had to choose where the cabinets go. Uh, we've had to agree where the cabinets go. We apply for a planning permission to put those cabinets in, so on and so on. It's been uh, an enormous amount of work. Um, and you know, planning is part of it. So we've had to design the network, plan it, huge civil engineering uh, procurement um, process to uh, find civil engineering contractors to come and actually dig up the footpaths. Um, we've had to find companies that know how to then install the fibre optic cable into those trenches and into those ducts. We've had to completely re-engineer our core network which sits here in cows that connects us to the outside world. Um, that's pretty much done. Uh, we've had to choose the supplier of our street network equipment, so the equipment that goes into the cabinets, in fact, even the supplier of the cabinets. Um, the passive network components, they call it plastic, so everything that goes in the ground, including the fiber optic cable, is plastic. There's about um, two to three million pounds worth of that sitting um, in a yard in Southampton, waiting to come across here just in time to be buried in the ground. Um, we've had to choose what routers we're going to put into um, our customers' homes to give them the best, uh, the best experience. And we've had to completely re-engineer our back office uh, systems in order to uh, be able to deliver that at the scale we need to deliver. And of course, we've had to train, um, uh, retrain our, our employees on, on this whole new technology. We've been hiring, we've hired a lot. Uh, we deployed a pilot area a few miles from here in a place called Gurnard. So in that pilot area, we've already got 133 full fibre customers using the service. Um, they, um, overnight, literally within days of getting the new service, the amount of data that they use uh, doubled. So there is a demand um, for this if you make it really easy for people to use um, uh, use uh, the service if you just give them a broadband service that works. And our first pilot area uh, in Newport went live a month ago and already we have 17 customers there signed up uh, and using the service. So we've been busy. Um, I normally have a parade of pictures but I just wanted to prove to you that there are actually people out digging up the roads right now. The program started in earnest in September, um, so since then we've dug a modest amount of trench, about four kilometres, a um, few teething problems. A second contractor starts next Monday, um, also in, in Newport. Uh, so Newport, East Cows, is where we're working at the moment. By next March, we'll have, we'll have ramped up the factory to be digging around 40 kilometers of trench uh, per month so that the whole uh, project should be done within uh, the next two years. So, so here is the project. For those people who live on the island, everyone's desperate to know when am I getting it, when am I getting it. So here's our, our high level plan. Um, first part there is our existing network which will extend um, around the coast uh, to uh, as far as uh, Benbridge and Brading and then from Newport cross country to Lake uh, uh, down to uh, Sandown, Shanklin, Ventnor. Um, we have yet to figure out how we're doing West White. I'll come back to that in, in just a sec. Um, and then a different colour code here uh, because there are bits of the island uh, that are a little bit off the beaten track. Um, and the cost of getting to those places is quite prohibitive. Uh, fortunately, um, the, the government has, in its um, telecoms review a couple of years ago, um, have changed the rules around a thing called duct and pole access. So they're forcing BT to open up their existing ducts and poles to allow others to put their fibre onto those poles. So our plans to get to some of the more out of the way 
places, and so my apologies to people who live in in God's Hill and and, and Knighton and uh, Chale for suggesting they live in an out of the way place. So, uh, leader of the council lives in uh, Chale, uh, in so uh, Knighton. Sorry. Um, so we will get there, um, but we do that without having to dig up roads. We do that by putting uh, our fibre onto to BT's poles. Um, and here's our sort of rollout plan. Um, you'll see the, the colour code here is, um, the, the darker colour is our existing network, uh, the lighter colour is what we're calling infill, where we have some bits that got missed out first time through. Um, so you'll see all of that complete, you'll see East Coast complete by January, Newport complete by uh, June next year. Uh, Wooten's largely done, there's a bit in Fishbourne being filled in uh, by March. We'll be in Ride uh, early next year uh, as well, and we'll work our way uh, around the coast to Bembridge and Brading, whilst the other contractor comes um, cross country, uh, down to Lake, uh, then we sand down Shanklin, uh, right to um, uh, Ventnor and the yellow bits are the bits that we'll hopefully fill in um, by riding on the back of, of BT's infrastructure and the detailed planning of those uh, hasn't yet been done. Um, the, the, the challenge we have on the project is, is, is this um, and even people who live in the island are sometimes surprised when I uh, put this chart up. If I draw a line down the middle of the island around uh, Newport, uh, on the east of the island we have 69,000 premises and on the west of the island we have uh, fewer than 5,000. So that means they're further apart and if they're further apart I've got to dig more trench to get to them and the cost of digging trench at um, £150 a metre uh, is really prohibitive. So getting to West White is a real challenge. Getting to, to Chale, uh, to Knighton uh, is a real challenge. Um, so we are addressing that challenge, we're figuring out ways to do it, and I have a really high degree of confidence that we will hit the 65,000 number or more um, out of the uh, 74,000 homes that there are on the island with an objective. So Chris already alluded to some government grants that exist uh, for um, filling in uh, some of the uh, dark spots as they become known. Um, it's going to take a few years to figure that all out and, and, and to get there eventually. And my gut feel is there will be around about three to 5,000 homes on the island uh, that, that where you simply cannot make uh, business case, uh, even with a government grant for uh, deploying uh, full fibre. And the analogy to this is, you know, think of when electricity, uh, we started deploying electricity into homes. The first electricity was deployed into homes um, late 1800s, certainly became, became mainstream in the early 1900s. Um, the last homes to get electricity only got it, you know, in the late 1990s. And then there are still some homes in the UK that don't have mains electricity. So it took 100 years to deploy electricity to every home, pretty much every home uh, on the island. Um, it's going to take more than two or three years to deploy full fibre to every home on the island. There are alternative technologies that can deliver equivalent services. So I think that that's where we'll go for those really hard uh, to get places. And whilst I can be really sympathetic to, to people uh, who live um, out in the country with the beautiful, beautiful view out the window, um, you know, it, you are making a choice. If you want a nice view, um, then you might have to compromise on, on how good your broadband is. So, um, to summarise, what we actually have here right now in the Gigabit Island project is simply a massive civil engineering project. I'm a telecoms guy. I started life writing code for IBM. I know nothing about digging up streets. So we have an army of, of, of consultants, of contractors uh, that, know, that know how to do that right now. Um, the other big challenge is the public relations challenge of digging up the food paths. Uh, those of you who live here know we have a, a PFI 
in Island Road to have the task of renewing and maintaining uh, all of the roads and footpaths on the island over the next 25 years. They have a seven-year renewal program, and uh, we are in the fifth year of that seven-year renewal program. That means um, well over half of the roads have recently been resurfaced, and as I speak, around 30 to 40 percent of the footpaths. Um, and I completely understand a resident calling us stupid when we can't coordinate the two. Why can't you dig up the footpath and lay your cable before Island Roads resurfaces it? Um, and you know, the, the simple answer to that is, um, Island Roads does it in short lengths, maybe 400 meters at a time, whereas I need to lay cable you know, kilometers at a time. And if I had to wait till all the paths were resurfaced before I had a continuous um, cable, uh, we'd be still waiting on full fiber broadband in, in five years time. Um, and a host, a whole host of other reasons as well. So I apologize for digging up the footpaths, but it's, it is a simple choice. You can have a really pretty footpath um, and no, foot, no uh, gigabit broadband, or you can have a footpath with actually a really nice, neat trench at the middle. It really, you know, nice and neat, firmly uh, in a straight line, neatly filled in afterwards, and have gigabit broadband. So um, uh, you choose. Um, and we do have the challenge of how to cover those last 5,000, 10,000 homes. Um, I'm confident uh, we'll get there. And before I finish, um, I had to answer a journalist inquiry this week who wanted a copy of our accounts because he'd heard that white fibre were going bust. And he had, uh, had a letter from someone who had scrutinised from afar the business case for Gigabit Island and had basically said, it's a complete nonsense. Um, we don't need gigabit broadband, we've already got fibre broadband and it's good enough. And anyway, half the population in the island is really old and they don't have broadband anyway. Um, so, Fortnite, anyone who's got a 10 year old will probably not have seen their 10 year old for the last month as uh, Fortnite Battle Royale was released. They're living on it. They're, um, um, like I said, you, you, you don't see them. My next door neighbor's 10 year old, I was trying to be cool and talk to him about it. And I had a glance at his screen, and on his screen, um, he had changed his head-up display to show his ping time. And the ping time of uh, the people he was playing against. Now, a 10-year-old knows what ping time is. He knows what network latency is. Half the people in this room don't know what ping time is and don't know what network latency is. So you tell me, you tell me who, you know, you know Ask your 10 year old whether they need full fiber broadband. Ask your teenager, so Red Dead Redemption 2, latest version, um, came out um, actually just a few weeks ago. The Ultimate Edition on Xbox One is only available for download. You can't buy it on a disc, it's too big to fit on a disc, it's 110 gig. Um, if you're on an old fashioned ADSL connection, that's going to take you 24 hours to download. If you're on a pretty decent current white fibre connection of 100 meg, so there's no other supplier on the island can give you 100 meg other than white fibre, it'll still take you three hours. So for a 14 year old, that's, uh, that's a long time. Um, you had a gigabit connection, you can have it in 15 minutes, which actually is still a long time for a 14 year old, but a lot better than, than three hours. So again, so the person who's out there saying, writing to the newspaper saying, we don't need this, you know, ask, ask, ask our youngsters. Um, and this, you know, I, I put this up because this is my normal finishing slide. You, we usually talk about, and we're going to hear a lot of it today, there are lots of great ideas that are going to enable us to exploit gigabit uh, broadband infrastructure. But for me, it's, and I could, we could talk about, you know, health, e-health, remote health, uh, monitoring, 
uh, are all sorts of things that no doubt we will talk about later. But the reality is the Gigabit Islands is an enabler to any ideas uh, that you have. It removes the barrier uh, to the deployment of all of those new technologies. And, and I, I frame it this way, Gigabit Broadband is broadband that just works because there is so much of it that there's nothing foreseeable for the next five or 10 years that is going to demand more bandwidth than we can deliver. So it's gigabit broadband is like turning on the water tap or flicking the switch on an electric plug. It just works. When you turn on your water tap, you're not measuring the pressure of the water. When you turn on a plug, you're not measuring how many um, amps is being delivered. Um, and when you turn on your broadband, if it just works, I'll, I'll guarantee you, the only time anyone here ever does a speed test is when their broadband isn't doing what they want it to do. When it does what you want it to do, nobody's looking at how fast it goes. So that's what we're, that's what we're bringing here. Broadband that just works, a digital infrastructure second to none anywhere in the world. This is a point-to-point -point full fibre network. There's only one other point-to-point -point network being deployed in the UK. Uh, a company called GigaClear, which also operates in rural areas, also funded by Infra Capital Partners. The other point-to-point -point networks are in places like Singapore and Korea. Um, so really what we're building here is second to none, making possible our digital island. Thank you.